Welcome to the third presentation in this series. This one going to be looking at genetically modified organisms. And today we have four learning objectives. So the first is to describe undirected and directed methods of producing genetically modified plants and animals, including examples. The second is to explain the basic principle of modifying genes with CRISPR technology, including some applications. The third is to explain how PCR can be used to determine if an organism is genetically modified and to interpret results from such experiments. And the fourth is to describe why government regulations for genetically modified organisms are important. But before we get into the details, let's step back a bit and look at the example of vitamin A deficiency. So this is a, a figure of vitamin A on the right. Um, and a very important compound, and lack of it causes one to two million deaths per year and over half a million cases of irreversible blindness uh, every year, as shown by this person on the left. Against this backdrop has been the development of something called golden rice. So golden rice makes a vitamin A precursor, so something called beta-carotene, and originally it used genes from daffodils and bacteria, but later used genes from maize or corn um, once uh, that was available. And the whole point of this is to improve food nutrition. So people who eat this golden rice uh, get a good amount of vitamin A in their diet. The person who has been really pushing this is a guy called Ingo Petricus. Um, and it's a very interesting example of a genetically modified organism because there's a very clear health need. Um, the, the golden rice has been made available for free, which means there's sort of no corporations involved. So a lot of the criticisms of genetically modified organisms are around uh, commercial, um, commercial issues to do with the release. And there's also been an extreme amount of safety testing. So this particular example is an interesting one because it takes the issue of genetically modified organisms back to first principles. So today we're going to be looking at a few different questions. First of all, what are genetically modified organisms or GMOs? How are they made? And what is the debate about? At this point, it is probably important to step back and look at this idea of artificial selection, where we've taken a natural organism and turned it, uh, often over thousands of years, into quite different forms. So here what we're looking at in the center of this figure is wild mustard, so a natural plant that hasn't been modified by humans at all. But around it we see a whole lot of different organisms, or different plants, that we have modified from wild mustard. So by selecting for leaves, we've made kale. By selecting for auxiliary or side buds, we've made Brussels sprouts. By taking the, the stem and shortening it so that all the leaves fit together very tightly, we've selected for cabbage. And by selecting for bigger flowers, we've ended up with broccoli. And bigger stems, we've ended up with kohlrabi. So people have basically spent a huge amount of effort over hundreds or thousands of years taking wild mustard and turning it into a whole collection of vegetables that nobody really likes. This is another example, dogs. So all modern dogs derive from wolves, which are shown in the upper left of this figure. But we've made a huge variety of dogs of all sorts of shapes and sizes and long ears and short ears and all sorts of other things. And these are all made by artificial selection. So there's a genetic basis to all of the changes that you see here. And we've changed some organisms not for any particular practical reason at all. So for instance, carrots used to routinely be in many different colours, but later they were favoured to match the colour of the Dutch royal household, the so-called House of Orange. So the fact that most carrots today are orange is effectively a 17th century fashion statement. The big difference is that now we can change genes directly. So in 1982, uh, scientists made the first transgenic animal. What we're looking at here are two mice, but the mouse on the left has a, a growth hormone gene from a rat, and so it has grown bigger. 
And one of the reasons why people might want to make uh, animals that contain genes from other organisms is for this, uh, this thing called farming. So in 2009, the, the FDA, which is a, an organization in the United States that regulates drugs, it approves the first drug from the milk of genetically modified goats. So this goat here produces anti-thrombin, uh, so human anti-thrombin, which is an anticoagulant and anti-inflammatory, uh, which is needed for some people who have uh, a particular blood disorder. And here's the conundrum. So in order to get one kilogram of pure protein of this antithrombin, you can either milk one single goat or you can collect it from 13,000 human blood donors. And the challenge with that is that many of those individuals or some proportion of them might have uh, diseases and so it's very hard to make sure that the supply from the human blood donors is, is reliable and is also safe. And of course changes out in the wild can arise by spontaneous mutation. So here we've got two examples. On the left you've got uh, a Belgian blue which has got this amazing muscling. On the right you've got the Scottish Highland cattle with the amazing horns and long shaggy coats. So there's no genetic engineering here. These are just changes that have occurred by mutations uh, that have just arisen by chance. And spontaneous mutation can happen in a number of ways. So it can happen, for instance, uh, by ultraviolet light, so UV light. It can also occur through chemical treatment, and it can occur through something called ionizing radiation, which is basically cosmic rays from space. And these changes, though they're sometimes negative, can often lead to a new phenotype, like some of the ones we've seen. The important thing, though, is that usually we don't know what the mutation is. So, and we also don't know if there are other changes in the genome that, um, that cause other things that we don't know about. But these kinds of mutations, leading to Scottish cattle and to dogs and to broccoli, these spontaneous mutations are usually treated as natural. In contrast, we can now do directed mutation. And so there's a number of ways to do this. The two generic approaches are to bring a new DNA from another organism, so a transgenic organism. So you might take uh, a recombinant uh, plasmid containing a gene from a human and put it into a bacterium. The second approach is to modify existing DNA using a, uh, using a technology called uh, CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas. It's worth looking a little bit more at CRISPR, which is a, a new technology that has become a lot more prevalent. So the Cas9 protein forms a complex with guide RNA. This RNA is a small piece of RNA or nucleic acid that matches a specific bit of DNA in the genome where you might want to make a change. Then the Cas9 RNA complex attaches to genomic DNA at that specific site that matches the guide RNA sequence. Then the Cas9 protein cuts both strands of the genomic DNA and then the new DNA, which could be a single base pair or could be a larger fragment, can be inserted or deleted from that bit of the genomic DNA. So this is a very targeted way of making very specific changes to the DNA sequence of an organism, perhaps as small as a single base. CRISPR can be done in vitro, so in other words in a test tube in a laboratory setting, or it can now be done in vivo, so in a living organism. This is one key way to make genetically modified organisms. So here's an example. There's a disorder called Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it is based on a, a key muscle protein called dystrophin. Errors in this lead to muscle degeneration. But at least in mice and in dogs, CRISPR has been used to fix this particular gene. And it's managed to do it by having the disorder occurs in this exon 50 of this particular gene. And the CRISPR has just cut out the entire exon 50, which has no other effect, but means that the reading frame is restored. So basically it takes a damaged gene and turns it back into something that is now functional again. 
The problem, perhaps, is that you need to fix the dystrophin gene in most muscle cells in the body. So doing this in mice is a very good start, but mice are, of course, much smaller uh, than, than humans. And this is why the, the ability to fix uh, this particular gene in dogs was such a major advance, because dogs are over 250 times bigger uh, than mice, and we are only about three times bigger than dogs. So this means that the technology that has been used to, to fix this particular disorder in dogs has the potential to fix the disorder in humans as well. There's other uses that have been proposed as well. So one is to remove caffeine genes uh, for coffee. So if you are making decaf coffee, um, it's a very nasty process that uses a whole lot of different chemicals. One solution might be to make coffee plants with the caffeine genes already knocked out. This would allow you to keep all the compounds that the plant makes uh, that lead to the taste and the smell of, of caffeine, or uh, well, of coffee, um, but just lose the caffeine. So here's the first of our class discussions. So what is Cas9 and what does it do? The options are A, a complementary RNA molecule that binds to target DNA, B, a guide RNA protein complex that cuts double-stranded DNA, C, a guide DNA molecule that binds to target DNA, or D, a protein enzyme that cuts double-stranded DNA. Perhaps stop the video for a moment and think what you believe the answer is. The answer in this case is D. Cas9 is a protein enzyme that cuts double-stranded DNA. Let's quickly go through those other answers and see why they're not correct. A, is Cas9 complementary RNA molecule? Well, no, there is a guide RNA, but Cas9 is the protein. It's not the RNA molecule. Similarly, Cas9 is a protein, so it's not the guide RNA protein complex. That's a mixture of both the RNA and the protein. So that's A and B out. And C is not the guide DNA. Cas9, again, is the protein. Here's another class discussion. What are the possible outcomes after the DNA cleavage step of Cas9? A, insertion of multiple genes. B, repair of a gene. C, loss of a large chromosomal fragment. Or D, all of the above. Again, stop the video and see if you think you know what the answer is. The best answer here is B, repair of a gene. Now, you could argue a case for A, that you could insert multiple genes um, using CRISPR-Cas. Um, but certainly C is not true. So you would not normally use CRISPR-Cas to modify large chromosomal fragments. It really is about uh, small numbers of genes or exons or single base pair changes rather than large structural chromosomal changes. Uh, so because C is wrong, D is also wrong for the same reason. The best answer here is B, repair of a gene. One way to make genetically modified plants is to use a bacterium called agrobacterium. So plant cells are very easy to clone, and this makes them quite different from animal cells. So for instance, it is possible to take a single cell from a plant and regenerate an entire plant from that one single cell. So what you could theoretically do is insert foreign DNA into a plant cell, and from that, regenerate an entire genetically modified plant. What we're looking at here in these pictures is on the left, you've got something called a callus, in this case from garlic. So these are undifferentiated cells. In picture two, you're starting to see them begin to differentiate, though. So you're seeing leaves emerging. And in picture three, you're seeing entire plants with leaves and with roots. So Agrobacterium tumefaciens is a bacterium that allows DNA transfer. It's a natural function of the bacterium. It causes these things called crown galls. If you walk around the city, you will often see these sort of galls on trees. They're just a naturally occurring phenomenon. And the transfer of DNA is mediated by a plasmid called the TI plasmid. And this TI plasmid, or at least part of it, called the tDNA, integrates randomly into the plant genome. Now, I do want to emphasize that this is slightly different from what we were talking about in the last presentation. So when we were talking about bacterial plasmids 
last time, those plasmids do not integrate into the bacterial chromosome. But in this particular case, the tDNA does integrate randomly into the plant chromosomes. So how does this work? TI plasmid transfer. You've got Agrobacterium tumefaciens, and you've got this thing called the TI plasmid containing the tDNA, which has got restriction enzyme sites in it. What we can do in the laboratory is include a recombinant gene into that, um, also a foreign gene, so some gene you want to, to study from some other organism. You can put it into the, the tDNA region of the TI plasmid. You can insert that plasmid, that recombinant plasmid, into the plant cell. And then because you can grow up cells from, uh, grow up entire plants from a single cell, you now can generate a plant uh, with a new, new trait or a new thing that you want to study. Animals are a bit harder. So you can make transgenic animals by nuclear injection. So you've basically got to go back to eggs. So what we're looking at on the right here is an egg cell and it has been injected into the nucleus uh, DNA from, from your foreign gene. So you've taken a gene from another organism, you've injected it into the nucleus, and it is just going to randomly integrate into the genome. As you might imagine, this is not a particularly subtle process. So only a small number of these cells survive. But if they do survive, they divide, and then all cells contain the transgene, and that can grow into an embryo, and then into a transgenic organism. So here's a class discussion. Imagine that you want a transgenic plant to express a protein from a bacterial gene only in its leaves. What regulatory components would you need? And you've got options here. You've got regulatory regions shown in green that are either leaf-specific or plant-specific, and you've got Gene promoters, so these are basically switches that turn the gene on or off, and you've got either the bacterial copy or a plant copy. So what do you think the correct answer is here? A, B, C, or D? Stop the video, have a bit of a think, and then restart the video to see. The correct answer in this case is C. You need the regulator region that is least specific and the plant gene promoter. Now what we wanted is to express this protein um, only in the leaves of the plant. So it's perhaps not surprising that you use a leaf-specific regulatory region. Okay, so that answers A or C. It automatically rules out B and D. But why do you use a plant gene promoter and not a bacterial gene promoter? Well, remember that the gene promoter is effectively a switch. So in order to turn uh, the expression of a particular gene on in a plant, you need the plant switch, the switch that the plant will recognize, even if it comes from a bacterium, that particular gene. If you have the switch that is recognized in the bacteria, when you put into the plant, the plant won't recognize it, and it's not going to work. So in this particular case, you need a regulatory region that is leaf specific, and you need a plant gene promoter. Another class discussion. Here you have a transgenic animal that is made by nuclear injection of DNA into an egg cell. Here's the question. Is the transgene present in A, every cell of the animal, B, a particular set of cells, say determined by the promoter of the transgene, C, only a few random cells of the animal, or D, cells targeted by the scientist? Have a bit of a think about this, stop the video, and then see if your answer is correct. The answer is A, every cell of the animal. So remember that we start off with a single cell and we insert the transgene into it. Assuming that it's successful, that cell divides and although the, 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 the entire DNA of the, um, of the cell is copied, so too is the transgene. So you end up with two uh, daughter cells, each of which contain the original DNA and also a copy of the transgene. So the transgene is present in every cell of the organism. It's not going to occur in just a few cells, as in, in, as in question or option B. It's not going to occur in a few random cells, as in option C. And as at the moment, 
it's not really possible to target particular cells um, by a scientist or anyone else. Here's another question. After injecting DNA into an egg cell, the transgene usually integrates into one place and only one single chromosome. When the animal grows up, which of its gametes, so its sex cells, so sperm or eggs, which of its gametes carry the transgene? A, all gametes, because all of the body cells contain the transgene. B, no gametes, because foreign DNA is removed during meiosis. C, random gametes, because foreign DNA is removed during meiosis. Or D, half the gametes, because genes segregate according to Mendel's laws. Have a little bit of a think, stop the video, and then see if your answer matches the correct answer. The correct answer here is D, half the gametes. The reason is this, so that the transgene does occur in every cell in the body. We, we've seen that in the last question. But remember that integration of the DNA into the chromosomes is a very rare event. So if you have an egg cell, it is going to contain two copies of every chromosome. The transgene will only integrate into one of those copies. So that when you have production of gametes during meiosis, you're going to separate them out according to Mendel's laws. One chromosome will go into one gamete and that will have the transgene. Other gametes will come from the other chromosome and they will not have the transgene. So all gametes will not have the transgene, but equally, it's not true that no gametes will have the transgene, and it is also not random. Half the gametes will have the transgene as indicated in option D. Another class discussion. You think an organism contains a specific transgene. How would you check? A, look at cells under a microscope to see the new DNA. B, do a chemical test to check for the new DNA. C, do PCR with primers that match any gene in the organism. Or D, do PCR with primers that match the transgene. Again, stop the video, think what the answer is, and then let's see if it's correct. The correct answer is D. Do PCR with primers that match the transgene. So let's look at the other answers and see why they're wrong. A, look at cells under a microscope. Well, you can't see DNA under a microscope, or at least not the sort of changes we're talking about, so that's not going to be an option. B, do a chemical test to check for the new DNA. There's no chemical test. The, the new DNA chemically is exactly the same as the existing DNA, so there's no possibility to do a chemical test. C, PCR with primers that match any gene in the organism. Well, that's not true because uh, some organisms that contain a transgene will have their own natural genes as well as those organisms that are not transgenes, uh, transgenic. So in order to figure this out, you have to do PCR with primers that match the transgene. Right, here's another example. So here you've got two gels that have been run out, and along the top you've got four different lanes. In the first lane you've got no DNA, in the second lane you've got just transgenic DNA, in the third lane you've got DNA from non-transgenic mouse, in the fourth lane you've got DNA from a transgenic mouse. Now, what you want to do here is PCR using primers specific to the transgene. Which of those two gels, A or B, shows the correct result? Have a bit of a think, and then stop the video uh, while you're doing so, and then come back when you think you know the answer. The answer here is B. So if you're doing a PCR using primers specific to the transgene, you should only amplify DNA uh, where the transgene is present. So. Obviously, you wouldn't expect to see anything in the first lane because there's no DNA there, but you would in the second where there's transgenic DNA. Equally, for B at least, there's DNA from the non-transgenic mouse, so you wouldn't expect to see a band there, but you would for DNA from a transgenic mouse in the fourth column. So 
So the use of genetically modified organisms is incredibly variable internationally. Some, pla some places, like the European Union, it is effectively banned. Um, in other places, like China, it's incredibly common. And then there's countries in the middle, like the United States of America, where there is some use for particular organisms. Genetically modified organisms are present in New Zealand, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. What we're looking at here are four different examples of very commonly used genetically modified organisms. None of these are grown in New Zealand, but they are eaten here or used here in other ways. So on the left, we've got um, upper left, we've got soybeans, and about 80% of soybeans grown around the world are genetically modified. In the upper right, we've got corn or maize. That's about 30% of all corn is uh, genetically modified. In the lower left, we've got canola oil or the canola plant, uh, about 25% genetically modified. And the bottom right, we've got cotton, which is about 70% of all cotton grown around the world is genetically modified. So if you're thinking uh, of your own clothing, for instance, a lot of your clothing will be cotton, and a lot of that will be made overseas, and chances are a vast majority of it will be made from genetically modified cotton. New Zealand regulations, though, are, are very, very strict. So genetically modified organisms and their use are highly regulated in New Zealand, and they're regulated by the, the Hazardous Substances and New Organisms Act, which is often known by its abbreviation, HASNO. Um, in New Zealand, there's no field use of any genetically modified organisms, including those created using the CRISPR system. But you are allowed to import genetically modified food, um, although it is regulated. One interesting point is that the use of spontaneous mutation to make new organisms is completely unregulated. So even if new organisms are made by chemical uh, methods or UV mutagenesis, um, those can be grown and commercialized in New Zealand uh, without further regulation. You can't talk about this topic without at least touching on the idea of ethics. So golden rice, for instance, which we talked about early in this presentation, is banned by many developing countries. Um, but it has also been approved by others, such as the Philippines. So things are moving very quickly, and people have very strong views on, on what we should or should not be doing with genetically modified organisms. In 2018, Hei Jung Kui oversaw genetic modification of the first humans. So he took uh, two, uh, two twins in China and uh, changed their DNA code so that they would be resistant to HIV. And this was incredibly contentious. But we've now hit a situation where the first genetically modified humans have been made. Um, and there are very strong views about whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, which I make no comment on but it's something for the community to think about in a lot more detail. So next up, we're going to be talking about genomes and complex traits. Before the next presentation, if you have the book, you should read up about genomes in Campbell, page 442 to 446, and also learn about complex traits on pages 283 to 285. If you don't have the book, you could read up about these particular topics online, or otherwise, we'll hear about them in the next presentation.